Hi, I'm Dr. Sally, and it is a real joy to be here with you tonight. Um, we decided that we would pre-record this bit of the talk. Later on, we'll have some questions, um, but it was really to avoid any technological issues, but I am very much present with you tonight. And do use the chat box that we have um, in Zoom. If Shane hasn't already invited you to, please put where you're from. It, it was always such a joy to see this expanding network of um, people that are gathering around food and particularly this role that food has um, in our health. Um, and do put your questions in. I'll be monitoring the chat and we'll have an opportunity later to dive a little bit deeper and answer some of those questions. So tonight we're talking about the role that food has in our immunity. Our immunity is um, that ability we have innately to fight infection and to keep us disease free. It'd be no news to anyone that we are in the midst of a global pandemic with the COVID-19 virus. And we have had a lot of instructions from our government that are focused very much on reducing transmission, the hand washing, the social isolation, the social distancing, all serving to flatten that curve. But really that reduction in transmission, which I fully endorse, is all about our health systems being able to cope and respond to you should you become unwell. And very little focus has been on our own ability to fight infection, that immunity. And it saddens me because the science is really irrefutable that the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, how we sleep, how we move, how we connect, um, and how we eat, all have an impact on our immunity on a day-to-day -day basis. And this hasn't been talked about much. And tonight we're going to talk about the nutrition piece, but also to set that within the context of what we can be doing to improve our immunity and reverse all disease. I'm going to share a little bit about my own story, my own approach to health. I'm going to set that context and then we're going to take that deeper dive, looking at six, six aspects of how we eat um, and how that impacts our, our immunity. And then we'll have some questions at the end. So I'm Dr. Sally. I um, have been a medical doctor for 21 years and I am founder of Dr. Sally Bell. I use an approach to health that focuses not on disease, but looks at you, that focuses not on suppressing symptoms, but tries to get to the root of why you're unwell and looks at the whole of you instead of focusing on a part of you. It's really about personalized care. And I run a small clinic, um, but also uh, speak um, for people like the British Army on wellness. I'm often on BBC Radio and I'm uh, constantly campaigning for real food to be accessible to all. I'm currently taking a lot of what I'm doing online um, because my heart overall is to put health very much back into your hands. So my own story of how I got into this approach to medicine is really started as a little girl. Like I loved to help and to um, alleviate pain. I, I, I grew up feeling the pain of brokenness in the world and wanted to respond to that. And that desire shaped my decision of going into medicine and really has been a thread throughout my adult life. However, after spending the first half of my career training in general practice, and um, I went overseas working for an aid agency in Sudan and Uganda um, and Mozambique and um, providing acute care, um, I found myself halfway through my career back in the inner city as a GP here in Nottingham, uh, a job that I loved. Um, but I found like I just felt like I was a pharmaceutical vending machine, you know, uh, and there was this massive pressure um, for us to get people into a disease category and to follow a guideline which is often heaven, heavily weighted towards prescribing. And then I'd find I was often prescribing because the drug I prescribed had caused um, side effects. And I never felt like I was getting to the root of why people were unwell. Um, and then with the pressure on our system here in the UK to see patients, we were having 10 minute appointments, we were losing continuity of care. And I was at the point in my career where I might be seeing 40 patients a day, 10 minutes at a time. They didn't know me, I didn't knew, know them. And I honestly felt I was doing more harm than good um, with the prescribing that I was doing, even if it sat within guidelines because I was never getting to the root of why that person was in unwell. I couldn't help them understand that and couldn't lead them towards feeling well. Um, and then what happened is I lost my own health. 
and um, I had all these weird and wonderful symptoms, um, brain fog, fatigue, weird sensations on my body. I would struggle to word find. Um, I'd find my my purse in the fridge and um, just odd things like that. And I dreaded going to my doctor because I couldn't work out what was wrong with me and I couldn't fit into a disease um, category. And so, but I went and I'd have blood tests. I'd be told they're all normal and made to really feel like I was possibly making it all up. Uh, and I was doing everything I knew how to do. I, you know, I'd had my three children. I'd lost my baby weight. I was eating what I thought back then was a healthy diet. Um, but then I had this moment where I suddenly couldn't coordinate my legs anymore on uh, the treadmill. And I went back to my doctor and, um, and I said, this isn't normal. And went through our health system here in the NHS. I, after lots of scans and um, investigations came out with my diagnoses and I came out with my drugs. And I remember having a moment where I sat with the neurologist in his office and I said to him, is there anything that I can do to get myself better? Like, I don't feel you're telling me why I am unwell. And he slipped a prescription across the desk at me and he said, Sally, try this. And I walked away and I thought, no, there has to be a better way. Um, and, and so I went back to the books um, and I, you know, I went, well, what does my body need? Like we learn no nutrition as um, doctors here in the UK. Um, and, uh, and some of what we are taught or we pick up from our dear dietitians is very much rooted in research back in the 70s and 80s. And I was just flabbergasted to discover like how much the research had come on since the 90s of when I tried, trained the the and you know the research into nutrition the research into our sleep our understanding of what stress was doing to our body and what actually triggers that stress response and the damage that it was doing um, and you know over the last 10 years I'm sure you'll be familiar if you are foodies and you're interested in food the discovery of the gut microbiome those trillions of bacteria and the role that they have in health and so I um, I then did some training over in the U, uh, over in America, and I recovered my own health very very quickly, and started to practice on anyone who would let me have a go, uh, and was surprised at what would get better. Uh, you know, things that I am told as a conventional medic should never get better, I was finding I could reverse and help people get off their medication and help people recover um, their health. And out of that, I designed a sort of framework to help sort of people recover health. I call it the five foundations to health. Um, and the reason that these foundations work, so these foundations include our sleep, um, our rest, which is all about tackling stress, our nutrition, our movement and connection, connection to self, connection to others and connection to that sense of purpose. Um, and the reason that these work is we are currently faced um, with a pandemic of chronic disease. You know, everything from our autism and our Alzheimer's and our depression and anxiety through to our cancers and heart disease and diabetes and autoimmune disease. Um, and it is crippling us as a nation. And when you look at the research, you know, 10% is due to our genetics, that information that's been handed down from our parents when 90% of these diseases are influenced by our lifestyle, or what we eat, how we sleep, how we move, how we rest, and how we connect. And here's the thing, like chronic um, disease is a lifestyle issue, and therefore the solution is in lifestyle, and that we cannot, it is ludicrous and insanity to think that we can keep medicating these things. And therefore, we need to come up with a solution that taps into this innate genetic brilliance, you know, of creating an environment that lets our bodies flourish. See, our bodies are wired to heal. They have um, innate ability to keep us cancer free, to keep us disease free, to balance our hormones. We even have like an innate system that will keep our weight at a stable and optimal weight. We have just lost the ability 
ability to hear uh, what's going on in our bodies and we have lost um, developing uh, rhythms and routines and practices in how we eat, sleep, move, rest and connect that creates an environment that helps our bodies flourish. So those five, found, when we talk about nutrition now and um, and looking at that impact on immunity, we need to set it within the context of those foundations. I have people come to me who are on the most incredible diet, they tick all of the boxes and yet they are still ill. And often it's because either they're sleep deprived or they're highly stressed or there's a lot of emotional issues going on around relationships or they're very disconnected um, from their selves. And we can, you know, eat perfectly, but if we don't set it within this framework, you know, it, it, it will, we will just undo all of the good work of making decisions around how we eat. So please hear me when we take this deeper dive um, into nutrition. So I do have a slide. Let me just pop it up on the screen. Um, so, and I'll pop me up there. Um, this slide's available on my website. If you go on drsallybell.com under resources, it's there as a download. Um, I am just making reference to it now. One, it will give you hope that I'm only gonna cover six points when we're looking at food, but two, it's gonna act there as a reminder if you want to go back and just reconsider some of those um, principles. I will pop it up again at the end, um, but I, um, I, I won't keep it on all the time. So does food play a role in our immunity? Of course, you know, I'm going to say yes. Um, but let me talk to you a little bit um, about the why. Uh, and, and, and I'm going to talk around um, six points that I want to consider as we consider the argument of, of, of the importance of food in our immune response and our ability to fight infection and keep us disease free. I think the first thing that I need to say is that um, you know food is more than calories. We as a health profession have been banging on about calories, low fat food messages, which I think are a disaster um, and calories restriction. And we paint this picture that if you're thin, you're healthy. And we have just been pushing this. Um, you know, for 30, 40 years. And yet here we are in 2020 in the UK as the fattest nation in Europe. Um, and one of the issues is, is that we have lost our understanding that food is more than calories. Food is actually information to our bodies. And the things we eat have the ability to push us in one of two directions. They can push us towards disease and they can damage our bodies, but they can also push us towards health and help us heal and repair. And so the first thing I just want to put into our head is we can consider food is that we need to think about it within that context, that food is information to our bodies and has that ability to impact our well-being, our health, our emotional health. I think the second thing that I want to say around food, which again seems like a really common sense kind of um, uh, statement but I think it just needs saying um, in that food are the building blocks for our body to be able to function properly and while I've said we're the fattest nation in Europe here in the UK we're also malnourished we don't have the basic building blocks for that our body needs in order to operate and in order to do that ingenious amazing thing of repairing and healing and keeping us well you know, I say, um, you know, it's a bit like baking a cake, you know, to bake a cake, you need sort of eggs and flour and sugar and butter um, and some kind of fluid to bring that together. Um, you pop it in the oven and and there we go, you get a cake and, it, and, it's, and it's similar with our body. Like if I said to you, here is some sugar and egg, can you make me a cake? You'd go, flip, that's ridiculous. I need this, this and this. And yet how is it with our bodies? We do just that very thing. We don't give it what it needs in order to function. And when you look at the building blocks around immunity, um, as in with all health, there are essential things. 
One, we need to understand that a lot of our hormones that are um, moderating and controlling the processes in our body, including our immunity, you know, are made of proteins. And, um, and certainly, you know, with this move towards vegetarianism and veganism, people need to understand that as they move into that, that plant uh, proteins are, um, they aren't complete proteins. So complete proteins have these essential building blocks called, the, uh, called amino acids and they're essential for our body to function and plants except with the exception of maybe quinoa um, you know don't provide us um, with complete proteins um, and so we need to make sure that we are covering all the bases um, around protein because they are some of the essential building blocks for you know a lot of our hormones and our transmitters that help us function and when you're looking at immunity you know we have demonized fat um, over the decades, uh, almost put a fear of it. And everybody just thinks fat is energy. But again, like, oh my goodness, there are many different types of fats and these fats have very different roles in our body that are very essential to us functioning properly and very important around immunity and that ability to um, create these molecules that help um, facilitate keeping us disease free and infection free, um, as well as fat you know, hugely being involved in nerve health and brain health. You know, I could go off on one about, you know, uh, the devastating impact of depression and Alzheimer's is having on our uh, on our nation when 60% of our brain is fat. Um, and we need the right type of fats in order to, um, to keep our brains healthy and keep our immune uh, uh, system healthy. So there's that important around our macros, you know, our, our protein and our fats. But then in our immunity, you know, it's like lots of factory line processes when we're responding to and gobbling up these infections and keeping balance in our body. And along those factory processes, there's lots of things that we kind of throw in to make that process happen, these enzymatic pathways. And that's very dependent on our micronutrients. You know, so those are our vitamins and our minerals that we get from our food um, that are vital. And, and I see certainly in my clinic, um, a lot of people being deficient of their B vitamins magnesium choline and it goes on and on um, and those are vital you know in order for our body to function um, and that's why when we look at food we need to think not only you know what is this doing to our bodies but is it packed full of nutrients is it nutrient dense does it have all these lovely things do i have a diverse diet that actually has you know these wonderful proteins and fats and micronutrients and then we have to mention you know the phytonutrients which are plant chemicals that we'll talk a little bit about later um, but they are also work an incredible amount of magic often directly with our genetics switching on and off genes that control disease and those are your things like your curcumin and your flavonoids and your catechins and gosh it goes on I think there's two 25,000 different plant chemicals that interact with our body and can influence um, our health so I hope um, that just sets the scene for the fact that you know food is more than calories it is information to our bodies how we need to think have we got all the building blocks on board are we eating a nutrient dense diverse diet to um, give our bodies the best ability to remain disease free and virus free and then we come on to my next point, which, um, you know, is a massive topic in itself, but it needs mentioning. And that's the role of our gut in immunity. So as I mentioned before, you know, the gut microbiome is this vast colony of bacteria in our in our gut um, we are more bacteria than we are human and um, certainly when I trained in the 90s we had no idea um, that uh, of just how important it is and we now understand that as we lose that diversity as we lose um, um, that robustness in that community of bacteria it impacts disease everything from your autisms and your Alzheimer's to cholesterol blood pressure depression I mean, every disease, you know, is impacted by this role. And we now understand that it's not just sitting there doing nothing, that this is ex this exchange, that as we feed and we nurture and we look after our gut bacteria in exchange, it does a whole host of incredible 
um, things. And actually, when you look at immunity, 70% of our immunity is actually in our gut. So really, and I think it was Hippocrates that said, all health starts in the gut and how right he was. And um, if you're confused about where to start with your health, always start with the gut and looking after your gut bacteria. Um, and why is this important when we're considering food? Because they love to eat. And we damage our gut bacteria by our diet. We can also change it and make it more robust and diverse by our diet. Um, and what we eat very much impacts um, that ability to, to cultivate a robust colony of bacteria in our gut. Um, so food is vital for that, as well as we have to set that within the context of sleeping well and stress and a whole host of other things, even how we're born and how we're weaned. And so and um, and really, it also just strikes me that it's just another expression of how bacteria and viruses and fungi have been um, informing and um, developing and growing our immune system for millennia and how vital they are for life. And this fixation on everything being sterile. Um, is actually to our detriment um, and how they're an important part of our health. And we actually have microbiome in not just our gut, but we have it in our nose and in our lungs and eyes and skin. And they're all a really important part of um, keeping us healthy and keeping us disease free. Um, and so, and we know that actually what we eat and you know what we put on our skin and um, impact um, you know the the diversity and the, the robustness of those different colonies, and then in turn impact that ability to keep us infection free. I mean, it's just brilliant, like this um, you know realizing just the part that bacteria have very much. Uh, um, in keeping us healthy and that brings me to my next point really so around soil health and so when I you know developed this framework and initially my big focus has always been uh, when I've considered the nutrition piece that um, to get people off processed food and onto real food and the nutrition wars out there just really sadden me and um, how we can't seem to get the vegans and omnivores and gluten-free, dairy-free, paleo all together and have a conversation about the health of our nations. And there's so much emotion involved in which camp you sit in. And I think what's important really um, when we're looking at diet is, is, you know, diets that work for us as communities that work for us with our land and our farming and, and understand that um, and work with our values. But what's really important is that we're eating real food. You know, the biggest thing that's going to affect us as nations is getting off highly processed food that's devoid of nutrition and full of a lot of foods that really inflame us and really drive insulin resistance and get us back onto real food, which, you know, feeds our gut bacteria gives us the building blocks and um, you know and promotes health um, however what I realized a couple of years ago is that I hadn't looked far enough upstream and there I was getting people eating real food but I didn't realize how broken our food system was um, I didn't understand the devastating effect that our intensive farming over the last 50 years had had on our soil health and on the nutrient density of our food and on the chemicals that I was getting exposed to, um, as well as how we process food and how far it comes um, and how far it travels and when it's harvested and all these things impacting, uh, you know, the role that food has on health and on our diet and on our gut bacteria. And so, you know, I started doing a lot of research and we've got very much involved in the regenerative farming movement here in the UK and visiting farms, trying to understand, you know, what was going on. And I want to make two comments. It's a massive subject. It really is. The um, intensive farming has had a devastating effect on our planet and it's having a devastating effect on our health and it's a complex. Um, and it's just another time that we don't need to distill it down into good and bad and black and white. And we need to grapple with the complexity of the, the situation. But I think the two points that I would like to draw here um, is, is this one. 
Um, you know, intensive farming has stripped our soil of its natural health. It destroys its own microbiome, which is really, really important for biodiversity, for pest control, for, um, you know, and feeding our plants, you know, these micronutrients. We're very obsessed, you know, in intensive farming methods of pouring phosphorus and nitrogen into, into the ground. But we forget that actually it's all these micronutrients that our body needs um, in order to operate and um, and so I think when you think about intensive farming methods and the impact that's had our, on our health is that it's affected the nutrient density of our food. Now there's there's a bit of controversy around this because really you know and um, when you look at foods um, and you're measuring nutrient density there's questions about how we mention it and actually we know depending on the sunshine that harvest when it's picked how far it's traveled you know, how much it's been allowed to ripen on the vine all impact you know the nutrient density of our food but i i think it's fair to say that as you look over the research of decades um, that we're seeing the nutrient density um, of our food diminish and so that carrot that you're eating today um, is very different and having a different impact on the body than it did um, you know 50 years ago and then there's the issue around the agrochemicals that are used to farm and the impact um, of uh, the residues of those chemicals being found in our food and its impact on our diet. I find it fascinating that, you know, the agrochemical um, businesses, I think there's, you know, six big ones that basically own the whole global market, um, would, you know, they categorically say we don't have to worry because, you know, these uh, chemicals don't harm he human health, they're there to kill bacteria, viruses and fungi. I feel point made, Lay, we are more bacteria than we are human. We now understand um, that the importance of our bacteria um, in human health and maintaining our microbiomes within our body. Um, and therefore, you know, it goes without doubt that as we're exposed to these chemicals, that's going to have an impact just on that level on our bacteria and the impact on health without then looking at the impact it might have on, you know, uh, hormonal disruption and DNA damage, um, which I think also is emerging in the research too. And then the other thing is that you will often hear when um, pushing these, these, these companies about the toxicity of these chemicals and our exposure is that you know it's it's you know it's trace there's a tiny amount um, and we don't have to worry but you look at the research and really it's all you know over a few years it's not accounting for the decades of exposure and um, let's not talk about epigenetics and the impact that has on the next generation either um, that's a whole other topic but it's this cumulative effect and I don't know whether you know but some of these chemicals take years and years to get out of our body they have really long half-lives and then the thing is it's not just that we're exposed to that little bit of glyphosate on our wheat but it's all of the other chemicals that are exposed in all of the other foods you know the antibiotics in our beef and um, and all the stuff they put in our chicken feed and um, you know and then you're looking at the chemicals and parabens and phthalates that we're exposed to you know through our furniture and through the stuff that we put on our skin and the air that we breathe and the lead in our water and I don't want to freak you out but you know there is a tipping point my conventional colleagues would roll their eyes at me and they would say oh Sally we have a liver you know we can detoxify yes we have a liver but I've already made the point that, um, you know, we are a fat nation, but we're malnourished. And for us to detoxify properly, we have to have the right building blocks on board to do that. And sadly, we don't. So the very system that should be dealing with these chemicals, you know, is, isn't is able to work satisfactorily. Um, and then we know that all of the wonderful real foods we eat also impact detoxification. And actually, we know that some of these processed foods can impede it. And so we have this tipping point. 
We live in a time in history when we are exposed to more chemicals than we ever have been in all of, you know, the history of mankind. And, and then we have, you know, a detoxification system that isn't able to work properly. And therefore we're seeing this tipping point where we're seeing the devastating impact, you know, um, on our health. And we now understand, you know, that yes, it's, in, it's impacting our microbiome, it's disrupting our hormones. It's, um, and actually some of these chemicals, they imitate things and they're driving the obesity story. They're driving the diabetic story. You know, triggering autoimmunity, and and so when we're thinking about food and the role food has in immunity, we have to think about where our food is coming from, how it is grown, and how it is processed. And personally, my conviction is that the regenerative farming movement, you know, has the solution in this, not only for human health but but for planetary health too. And I'd encourage you to look into that, and we can talk a little bit more about that if need be. But, you know, I think if we look after our soil, we look after our planet and we look after our human health. And that has to be part of the story as we're thinking about feeding our bodies in a way that is going to um, nourish us and give it the best ability to fight infection and remain disease free. So I said, you know, food is more than uh, calories. It's information to our bodies. I've talked about building blocks and that need for um, nutrient dense food, the role of the gut, you know, the role of where our food comes from and soil health. And then I think we just need to touch on two more things. One is how food can harm our bodies. And then the second, you know, would be, you know, how food can be medicinal and the medicinal purposes of, of food. Um, and so, you know, I think it's very clear that our Western, you know, standard diet that is highly processed here in the UK, um, you know, 50% of our diet is highly processed. And what I mean by that, what I mean by highly processed, it is, doesn't look like the food it's come from. Um, and often it has a whole host of lots of ingredients and words that we don't understand, lots of additives and chemicals to stabilize it and preserve it. And, and, and often, you know, the majority is made up of industrialized seed oils, which are highly inflammatory, were never part of our natural diet, your sunflower oil, you know, all that rubbish about flora being healthy. And, um, you know, it's full of these um, vegetable oils that are damaging our body. It's full of salts and sugars and the preservatives. Um, and a lot of, you know, the, we know that sugar is toxic to the body. And it's highly, um, you know, it causes a lot of problems. Um, but then also a lot of our processed food is full of refined carbohydrates, um, which again is just a simple sugar once you've eaten it. So, you know, you're driving that sugar story even more. And we know, you know, that this this standard sort of Western diet um, uh, damages our gut microbiome. And so food can harm and our current normal diet um, is driving um, disease. Uh, so we need to think not only about what we do eat, but also what we don't eat and getting some of these foods out of our diet, you know, and putting them more back into that treat box and that occasion or used in celebration, but not let it be part of our daily um, you know, our daily experience of food. And then finally, there's that bit about, you know, food as medicine. And, um, and I think there's, there's just a whole host of wonderful foods and lots of research coming out. Um, you know, your resveratols being anti-cancer and your curcumin and turmeric and your garlic and um, honey. And, and I think when you hear the claims around um, some of these plant chemicals and some of these foods, we have to kind of hold it in, um, in light of the fact that some research is just at a cellular level, you know, we're, we're seeing what's going on under the microscope. Some is kind of at, at, at an animal level. And then, you know, the research that's more relevant to us is the one that's established in, um, you know, humans. Uh, and unfortunately, this end of the spectrum, you, you know, your research can get all the way through here. But when you get to this end, it's very expensive to run human studies. Um, and, and often when you're thinking about foods, you know, you can't patent those and there's not the money and to be got by proving that your garlic is anti-cancerous and anti-inflammatory. Um, so you have to hold these in light. But I think it goes without saying that, you know, down at this level, 
Food is having incredible impact, you know, at a cellular level. You know, resveratrol, you know, found in grapes, found in our wine, you know, in animals is shown to, you know, turn on our anti-cancer genes. Um, and yet, if you try and translate the dosages into, you know, the, into what we'd need as humans, it'd be the equivalent to about 2,000 glasses of wine, which might be good news for some, but um, not good news for your liver. Uh, so, so we need to kind of hold some of these claims loosely. Um, but, I, but it, you know, you look at sort of ancient history and ancient cultures using plants in healing. Um, and you look at the evidence, you know, at that cellular and animal level and, and clearly, you know, it is showing us that these foods are switching on and off genes for disease and promoting health. Um, and some of those foods, you know, it's really about eating the rainbow, you know, uh, you know, having a diverse plant diet, um, not plant based, but, you know, important to have a plant slant. And it's the berries and your alliums and your brassicas, you know, all the wonderful spices, my goodness like um you know mixing those in as fresh as possible um you know as as well as do i say my berries yeah having your berries and so you, it, it yeah so when we when we talk about food as medicine people often just you know think about that um and that is an important part of it but i hope what i've managed to do when we're thinking about nutrition and health and our immunity is just paint a broader picture one we need to fit that within those other foundations that I spoke of. Because if you're sleep deprived and highly stressed, your gut's not gonna be functioning, you're not gonna be absorbing it. Um, and, uh, and it's gonna damage your gut microbiome, regardless of what diet you're on. So you have to fit your nutrition into good sleep, really managing your stress, you know, being connected to self and others and purpose and being someone who is moving as much as um, possible. Uh, and then we fit in, you know, that nutrition, that nutrition piece. And I hope um, I've taken you on that journey around food is more than calories, it's information to our bodies. You know, we need the building blocks, so we need a diverse diet. Um, we need to be feeding our gut bacteria and all our microbiome, thinking about what damages it and what helps it. We need to consider soil health and where our food comes from and the impact that that has um, on the food on our plate. Uh, we need to consider getting some things out of our diet or putting them back in that treat box um, uh, when we're thinking about certain foods and certain ways of eating. Uh, and then finally, you know, that whole arena of embracing a diverse amount of different foods with their wonderful medicinal um, benefits. So I hope that's helped. Um, I'm really looking forward to your questions. Um, I, like I said, let me pop those um, things, the, these slides just back up just to remind you that uh, this slide you can find on my website, drsallybell.com. And I hope we've just gone through all of those points. They're just a reminder. Um, I, I am blogging constantly. Um, so you can find me on any social media platform on Instagram, on um, Facebook will be the main ones that I interact with. I have a lovely community there um, blogging about all of those aspects of health. Um, and you can also find me at my website if you're interested in seeing my clinic or when my online courses um, come live next year might be something that you want to hop on to too. Um, and then also just to mention that those you know, food principles, the, the principles that are going to feed your gut bacteria and give you that balance, I've just outlined there um, on this slide. Again, this can be found on the resource section of my um, website. Um, it just outlines and gives some food for thought um, as you're preparing meals and thinking about your diet. Um, and my website is here, www.drsallybell.com. Um, so yes, yeah, so back to Shane to answer your questions. It's been great sharing with you. Um, over to you.